quite apart from her role as fashion icon, Princess Diana realized she also still had a continuing and important public function to perform as an ambassador for Great Britain. Ignoring the shouts of some IRA protesters outside, it was in to dinner, many of the guests by royal request from show business and entertainment. Gloria Vanderbilt, the Queen of Jeans. Tom Selleck of Magnum P.I. Clint Eastwood sporting a mildly punk hairstyle and John Travolta. John, are you going to uh, dance with the princess tonight? She'd like me to. <laughs> John Travolta told me that Nancy Reagan came over to his table and tapped him on the shoulder and said, we want you to get up and do the honors and ask the princess to dance. And everyone felt spellbound as this incredibly beautiful girl in her black velvet dress just swirled around the dance floor with, with um, John Travolta. It is hard to describe what has happened to Washington in these past three days. The most powerful people of the most powerful nation upon earth apparently swept off their feet as if by fantasy. They so nearly were the perfect royal couple and uh, it's a great shame I think that more wasn't done to help them get through the the obvious difficulties they had on a personal level because when they were working together as royal professionals they were a world-beating double act the prince and princess arriving for another but final Washington evening this time at the National Gallery the rich the powerful heads of multinationals the socialite ladies of Washington all pressing for the best spots to see, meet, talk with the royal couple. I'm sure I wasn't alone in seeing her very much in the rank of Queen. There were many, many occasions when you would just get a glimpse of her and realize that she was also extremely regal. It wasn't just that she was tall or just that she uh, had an aristocratic bearing, which of course she did, um, but there was also a a gravitas, a dignity about her, which made it very easy to picture her as a future queen. In 1987, Princess Diana found a new calling. It was a major turning point which would shape her public life ever after. All the speculation had centered on whether she would wear gloves when shaking hands with the staff and patients on the new ward. But to the delight of the staff, she clearly wasn't wearing gloves. And she shook hands with all the nurses, doctors and all ten patients on the ward. She stayed more than an hour, but was not filmed with any of the patients. They were worried about public exposure. When Diana went to the AIDS ward, AIDS patients were real pariahs. The patient himself didn't even want to have his face shown, even then. He was photographed from the back, so it was Diana you saw, and you knew she was there, and she was shaking hands, but you didn't see the patient's face. That was the time that we lived in. And, of course, it had major reverberations, and it showed how well and how brilliantly Diana understood the power of gesture. There was an awful lot of opposition inside the royal family amongst both the Queen and other courtiers, senior courtiers, that she should do that. And, but she went ahead. And now, uh, you know, you think, well, that's kind of normal for somebody in the royal family to do that. Then it was a tremendous change. <laughs> HIV does not make people dangerous to know. So you can shake their hands and give them a hug. The incredibly positive reaction to Princess Diana's AIDS visits made her realize that she could use her celebrity to campaign actively for a variety of worthwhile causes. It became a defining part of her life and helped to reinforce her global position. Surviving leukemia. Uh, about 50%. Yes, half of them are surviving. Her father was always tremendously good at talking to people. He was completely classless in that way. He'd go into the kitchen, talk to people. When he went to Diana's school, all the people remembered him because he'd come down and talk to the staff. And there was completely no side to it. And that's something that Diana inherited from him. 
It's easy to forget that actually the great majority of the time that Diana devoted to her charity work didn't go on glamorous, high-profile causes at all. These were, were not fluffy, easy charities to support, yet Diana devoted enormous energy to, uh, to helping them. It looked effortless, but Diana worked extremely hard at making the right impression on behalf of her causes. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever briefing I arranged for her, she would work on very hard, and she always made sure that she was extremely well informed. Those who imagine that drug and alcohol problems mainly affect the less fortunate members of our community would be quite wrong. Well, Diana was very professional. She would take a lot of trouble. She was very efficient. She'd always answer her letters. Um, she would go through her files and she would, you know, put everything in order. She would think also who could advise her best on various things like um, improving her speech making and her way of delivering things. We must remember then that the majority of Turning Point's clients... She took the task so seriously that she frequently composed her speeches herself, writing them out in longhand and making last-minute improvements before she delivered them. So we, in turn, must recognize the part that individuals can play in caring for all the casualties of our society. At the beginning of 1988, Prince Charles and Princess Diana were back on the Royal Roadshow, this time visiting Australia for its bicentennial. Few could have guessed that behind the facade, their marriage was effectively over, and that in private, the couple saw less and less of each other. Prince Charles's life was in fact increasingly bound up with his mistress, Camilla Parker Bowles. Many of you may not realize that part of my own education took place here in Australia. While I was here, I had the plummy bits bashed off me. But my wife and I are particularly glad to be here this year, on this great day, to help you, as if the Aussies needed help in anything, to celebrate your good fortune and to wish you well for a future that holds out such great promise. Although the royal couple were still trying to maintain appearances, they could sometimes barely look at each other. And sometimes Charles and Diana had to go through the motions, even though it can't have been very enjoyable for either. So into the dance, pausing only to hitch up the bodice. By the time of this visit, Princess Diana had actually begun pursuing a romantic relationship of her own. So the royal couple were now both leading secret private lives. Don't run away with the fact that it's just Prince Charles and Camilla because very shortly after Charles went back to Camilla, she was seeing her own bodyguard. She then saw James Hewitt, the uh, army captain. So, effectively, they were leading separate lives with different people. Princess Diana had started her affair with James Hewitt when taking riding lessons from him. She was quite a complex character, I think. The most notable thing about her when you first meet was her sort of char charisma and her beauty and her sense of fun. Initially, I met quite often at Cumbia Barracks in Windsor, where she'd come down and ride. Um, and then at friends' places and also at her home in London. Well, as you can imagine, it was quite difficult um, to be sensible and discreet about the whole thing. And I understood the risks, um, but um, sometimes you can't help yourself, and particularly as somebody who you become very friendly with and who needs that friendship and support and loyalty and help and and love. 